Hey, Lori. How are you? I'm good. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have with us this morning uh, John Holman from Eagle uh, Capital Management, and you're all by yourself. I am, once again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, we have, uh, we have your books, and you've got 30 minutes to tell us everything you need to know about Eagle for the last year. I will, I will do my best to give you the 40 minute condensed Eagle presentation so that you have at least 10 minutes to ask your questions. But uh, yeah, please also don't hesitate to interrupt if that goes wrong. Um, I did bring a, a presentation document which I believe you all have as well. And I will use that as a guide to make sure I don't miss anything. But uh, please, again, don't hesitate to have me fast forward and rewind as we go through. I want to start with at least two thank yous. One is to thank you for the durability of this relationship. It goes back to 2005. Uh, number two is to thank you for the additional funds earlier this year. Um, we appreciate these long-term relationships because they align so well with the long-term nature of our strategy. And frankly, we're still a small enough firm that we know all of our clients. And when I head out to Jackson, on we were firm on that Friday night. Uh, the analysts and everybody in the firm is wishing you well. And uh, we take this uh, personally as well as professionally. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I uh, would encourage you to look at page two, uh, the firm background, in which uh, if anything has changed since last year, I'll be sure to highlight it. But I would first highlight that very little has changed about the firm since last year. Uh, we were founded in 1988 by Robin Allen and Beth Curry, a husband and wife team. We're still very actively involved in the business. Robin Allen is our CIO, our chief investment officer, and, and Beth Curry is an analyst, as well as one of our backup traders. Um, they, uh, have, neither of them have any intention of retiring. Uh, they are 70 years old and uh, uh, they really live for this business and set the tone every day at the firm. It says here we have a single product. I would hesitate to use the word product because it's all that we do and it's all that we've ever done. It's the Eagle Equity Strategy. The strategy that you have here in your portfolio is the same strategy that every one of our accounts has. Um, and in fact, not only has it been our strategy since the firm was founded, but even before Ravenel founded the firm, this was the way he invested. And we built a firm around that strategy and hires only analysts who agree on the basic principles that we execute in the strategy. Uh, we disagree constantly about stocks, but we don't today the basic principles. Uh, here's a change, nine billion in assets under management. I think last year at this time, it would have been close to the seven billion in assets under management. And actually, as of last Friday, it's a little over 10 billion in assets under uh, the vast majority of those assets are uh, long-term assets just like this. It's public pensions, private pensions, foundations, endowments, <coughs> offices, and, uh, and a few uh, global sovereign-type entities, all of them intrinsically long-term focused. Uh, we're 100% owned by our employees. There are eight partners in the firm plus a profit-sharing plan that is the ninth partner and ensures that everybody in the firm has some participation in what we do. Uh, also, besides that participation, uh, the 401k plan is often invested in, uh, in the strategy. Uh, diverse team of 26 professionals, that's a higher number than last year. I think it was about 20, perhaps 21 last October. Uh, all of the additions to the firm have been in the area of client service and portfolio administration. The investment team is still seven people, and there have been no changes to those seven people. So just like the portfolio itself, the investment team has very low turnover. So if you step back from this, uh, you get a theme of concentration. It's a concentrated firm of only 26 people. It's a concentrated investment team of only seven. It's a concentrated portfolio of 25 to 35 stocks, and it's one strategy. And that keeps it simple, and keeps us very focused on what we do. And what we do is what you see in your portfolio. Page three, which you uh, may have flipped ahead to because it's the performance numbers. Uh, 
uh, reviewing it in a couple of different ways. I've outlined what each of the quarters have been since I last presented to you last October, uh, showing uh, the, uh, the performance versus your primary benchmark on the right, the Russell 2000, and showing that the performance was uh, positive in three of the quarters. Uh, as you're probably well aware, the, the third quarter of this year was a difficult quarter. Uh, it's not much comfort, but it's very little comfort that we did better than the benchmark index of the quarter, but it was down 14% in absolute terms. That means that uh, the calendar year to date is down 4.3% uh, through the end of September. Uh, the one year, that is uh, September to September, 4.9%. Uh, and since this is undoubtedly on your mind, I actually checked what the performance is through Friday night, and the year to date is now up 4.8% uh, versus down 1.1% from the benchmark index. Also gives you uh, some idea of how volatile the environment continues to be. Since we focus on the long term, I encourage you to do the same and look at those three, three year, five year since inception returns, uh, just as we are grateful for the durability of this relationship, we're proud of these long-term returns and uh, are very focused on sustaining or enhancing these long-term returns. So how will we do that? Well, let's look ahead to page five. And I'll reiterate our investment philosophy. <coughs> Because the way that we'll do this is to stick with our discipline. And our discipline is to buy undervalued companies with unrecognized growth potential. It's something that at first sounds very much like what every investor says or tries to do. Uh, so let me elaborate a little bit on that. Every stock that goes into the Eagle portfolio must have each of those characteristics. That means that we must regard it as undervalued based on what currently be well known about this, the company. In other words, it probably looks like a value stock at that moment that we buy it. But there must be some unrecognized change, some growth potential, compounding factor, if you will, that will become apparent over a long period of time, typically uh, beyond the market's current focus, which tends to be on the next year to 18 months. And that sort of time arbitrage, that ability to look past the market's obsession with the next couple of quarters is where our advantage lies, and it's a surprisingly durable advantage. That is, the market's tendency to look at the short term, uh, if anything, seems to be increasing. And it is possible to find uh, an interesting change that is underpriced. Uh, at least we can find 25 to 35 of those stocks at any one time. Another tenet on the second line is very important to us. That is to minimize risk with the idea that risk is greatest <coughs> when it is greatest. That is, if a stock is, uh, if, a, if the characteristics of the company are well known and uh, well recognized in the stock, you can still make money, uh, but you can also lose a great deal if you're wrong uh, because expectations are so high. Conversely, if we're the only ones who see something interesting about the company, uh, then the point of highest return can actually be the point of lowest risk. That is, if we are disappointed about things we see that the market doesn't see, then we don't tend to lose much money. Uh, that helps to account for the way we generate our returns over time. Uh, that is, when we are disappointed, it's usually an opportunity cost, something that we hoped would have materialized but didn't rather than an actual permanent loss of capital because it's something that we priced in and then lost money on, on pricing. So that the Eagle portfolio over long periods of time tends to go down a little less than the market because of our value discipline. But to participate in the market is doing well because of the underappreciated growth characteristics of the companies we invest in. In order to identify these companies, we have to have a competitive research advantage. And as I alluded to earlier, that's focused on the long term. It's focused on what I might describe as having a judgment advantage about the long term as opposed to an information advantage about the short term. 
the more you focus on the next quarter or two, the more you, it's really about having an edge and in information about the company. The more you look out to the next two, three, five years, which is more like our holding period for our companies, the more it depends on your judgment, the management team, and the long-term characteristics of the business. Uh, we deploy these ideas in a portfolio that's 25 to 35 stocks. Your portfolio is now 31 stocks. As Ravenel would say, why would you want our 50th best idea? Uh, really, we feel the optimal number is about 20. I think some academic research says 17, properly diversified, can be the right number. Uh, but we know that we're fallible. We won't quite get to 20. We'll have other ideas that we just can't resist putting into the portfolio. So it's 30 stocks tending toward 20 every day. And we maintain what we think are the best practices and discipline in every step of this process. Um, and uh, so we elaborate on that if time permits. I'm going to skip past the page six because I think value floor and free call option are implicit, like I said earlier. Focus on page seven. Give you some idea of what we mean when we say focus on the long term. There are a variety of, sh of, of Factors shown in the, in the left hand square that illustrate how the short term can create a buying opportunity. And examples would be uh, headline risk, uh, a cyclical downturn in a business that's only cyclical, um, guilt by association with other companies, uh, unsustainable pressures on the business. And one, one I would point out is, the, uh, is that businesses often invest in the short term in ways that pay off in the long term, but to cause them to, to say, miss the uh, next quarter or two uh, of, of uh, Wall Street expectation in order to do the right thing for the long term of the business. These short term factors can obscure the long term characteristics of a business. And that's uh, what I refer to in some of my preparatory notes is a kind of a promising obscurity. That is, in this current environment, which is both volatile and, uh, and lately, at least until the last two weeks, uh, uh, had downward pressure on stock prices, uh, there's tremendous potential for the long-term characteristics of businesses to be short-term mispriced. It has actually meant that there's much more than the typical level of activity on our research team is companies that we followed for years where we dare not <coughs> expect that they would be priced cheaply enough could suddenly become cheaper because uh, they have a disappointing quarter or because the market overall is priced down. And so really, uh, one answer to what's, what is going on in Eagle today that's different than, say, uh, three months ago or a year ago is that this activity level on the, on the research team assessing companies that might suddenly become cheaper is higher. And the right-hand side of this page is, is equally important to us. That these are factors that we tend to look for uh, that characterize how a business can change for the better, um, looking out past the next 18 months. It can be new management that confuses the market right now, but, it's, but after we meet them, we're convinced that they're very good for the company. Uh, geographic expansion, such as Google's increasing investment in international markets. Google's a stock we bought for you back in late April, early May. Uh, product extensions that uh, initially can be misunderstood. Um, uses of technology, such as investments in internal systems. Uh, a changing industry dynamic that can be for the better or for the worse. That can be a reason that we disqualify it. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at staples, for example, earlier this year, and couldn't get comfortable uh, with, the, uh, with whether perhaps the paperless office was a lot closer than it looks, and how much of the uh, typical staples store, for example, is dependent on paper and paper process. So that's both a plus and a risk management factor. Uh, and then uh, inflection points, where uh, some businesses simply reach a point where cumulative investments are going to about uh, significantly higher long-term growth. Uh, that's been true in a step function for a company we own called Altera, for example, which is in the semiconductor business. And each time that their chips shrink in size and become more power efficient, 
it actually opens up new markets for them. So once again, every stock has to be both undervalued and have long-term growth potential. Uh, I don't have a slide on this, but we do build a team around uh, executing this process. It's important to us that it be an intimate team. That's why it's only seven people. Uh, Ravenel, as our CIO, has the final decision in every stock that goes into the portfolio. He, if he were here, he would hold his hand up and say, I'm only this much taller, metaphorically speaking, than everybody else in that process. I think he's being a little modest, but he's trying to illustrate that uh, the, the, the decision-making process in the team is so open that by the time we decide to buy a stock, it's clear to everybody in that room why we're buying the stock and clear to, them, clear to us why, why the stock is weighted the way it is in the portfolio. It's about the opposite of a black box. We all know why a, a, a stock is going into the portfolio, and therefore the team feels invested in each idea. Uh, we also don't hesitate to have more than one person on the team working on every stock that goes into the portfolio. So while there's a lead analyst driving the idea, uh, we can have one, two, maybe even all seven people working on it at various points in time, including that if we bring a company <coughs> into us, all of us will attend so that we can ask the management questions from different perspectives and so that we can ask each other better questions afterward, having all heard uh, the presentation. Uh, and one final note about the team, it's a bit unusual, you think, is that we do not have annual bonuses at Eagle. Um, we feel that having an annual bonus, at least for us, would distract from the long-term focus of the portfolio and put too much emphasis on the current calendar year's performance. So instead, the only incentive available is the prospect of becoming a partner of the firm, which takes between two and five years of practice. and only happens if you help build the value of the portfolio in its entirety. Uh, that also means that it's easier for analysts to question each other's ideas because there isn't that extra sort of mental calculation about whether it affects a colleague's annual bonus to be shooting down an idea that the colleague has brought to the table. In fact, we view it as doing each other a favor to say no to an idea as early as in its gestation process as possible so that we can move on to better ideas. Uh, page 8 gives you some idea of what has contributed to the portfolio in, in each of the quarters so far this year. I'm not going to go into each of these stocks, so I'm happy to come back to any uh, that interests you. I'll just note that there's no obvious pattern in any given quarter to what the top contributors or the bottom contributors are. They seem to each be different from each other, both on the top contributors and the bottom contributors. And over the course of three quarters, the top contributors sometimes become the bottom contributors and vice versa, all of which is a good illustration of why we try to build this on the long term and not get too wrapped up in what the one quarter might, uh, might illustrate. Uh, page nine, I thought you might want to know what we've added to the portfolio and uh, positions that we've sold outright uh, since we last met. So we've added a total of four stocks over those four quarters. Uh, CVS, the pharmacy chain. PepsiCo, which we think of as a global snacks business because we bought it for its uh, Frito-Lay division. Uh, Goldman Sachs and Google, uh, which I've discovered are household names. Uh, the sales, since we last met, we sold our yachting position. Uh, this Liberty Global, you can ignore because that was just that we sold the A-class stock and we still hold the C-class stock, which is it's actually not a limited position. Uh, we sold L3, a defense company, uh, Liberty Media Interactive, which is TPC, Education Management, which is a for-profit education company, and Liberty Media Stars, which runs that movie channel. So as in virtually every other year that I know of, our portfolio turnover was low this year. It tends to be between 20 and 25 percent, um, even in periods of uh, dramatic market behavior. Uh, we don't manage to that number. It's just a natural outcome of our process. We 
if we're right about having the long-term focus on the business, we should also have a long holding period, particularly if we've identified some interesting long-term changes that will allow us to continue to hold this out. So having an average holding period of four to five years, I think, is appropriate. Excuse me. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Yes. Notice that uh, on the uh, first quarter of 2011, the CBS court was one of the bottom contributors. Uh, you show here the fourth quarter of 2010 is when you bought it. So the first quarter you had it lost, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you about these, like Walmart. It's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you? Uh, do you, do you watch this Walmart goes up, you sell it, and later you might buy it back again? Is that the way you operate? That can, that can be the way we operate. I, I won't uh, represent to you that we're always as nimble as we should be in, in selling the stock when it goes up and buying it again and put it down. In the case of Walmart, we held pretty steady for a long period of time. And uh, frankly, we've been wrong about some of the things that we hoped that they would do in Remerchandising and, and uh, trying out a different pricing strategy. Uh, we've stuck with it because we think the valuation is extremely attractive. Uh, the company is returning to its everyday low pricing strategy. Uh, we think it's very well positioned for the kind of slow growing economy that we're in. And uh, uh, we're giving it a little more room at this point. Uh, but as I, as I indicated earlier, the kind of mistake that we make, tend to make when we make mistakes, is to hold on to something for too long that's not making as much money, even if it's not losing too much. And I would say uh, Walmart and perhaps Microsoft could both be described in those terms where we stay with them for a long period of time, the growth that we originally anticipated hasn't materialized but we develop new reasons to stay with the stocks and, uh, and uh, we'll do so until we decide that those sort of characteristics aren't there. Those uh, stocks, I see you also got McDonald's and Coca-Cola. Yes. And all those have uh, been around in my lifetime. Uh, and that's a long time, by the way. But yet you have them. I just wondered as a practice, uh, buy them and, and hold on to them a while, sell them and buy them back later and that sort of thing. Because I noticed in uh, my read this section of the paper, like Walmart, I noticed it got $56. 56 down to about 51 back and forth. It's been that way for a long time. And uh, so I just wondered how you make money on it. Do they pay dividends? They do pay dividends. Okay. And, uh, and those dividends are a function of having a very high free cash flow. <coughs> so they can also use the free cash flow to buy back the stock. And, uh, and uh, ideally, we find companies that have the capacity to do both. So they have a strong cash flow position. And, and, this, and if the stock is still as cheap as we think it is, uh, we find it to be a good sign of management buys back the stock and they agree with us. Uh, they can do that and pay it for that so much the better. So, so the Walmart returns would be enhanced by having uh, the stock buybacks and, and the dividends. But you know, frankly, the growth has been disappointing. We, we really hope for more. Well, I wasn't so much interested in one stock as I was your general operation because I noticed these uh, companies, you know, with all these stocks that have been around a long time, mm -hmm. they seem to hang around the same price for year after year, and then it's going to have to money. Well, in, in, the, in your example of Coke and uh, McDonald's, they have they had a great couple of quarters. Yeah. And those have been sort of the opposite of the one like Microsoft. They've been on a tear, and uh, I won't, well, we aren't selling them until we're selling them, but. Uh, <laughs> Let me just say that the ideal eagle position is one that we buy when it looks like a value stock and sell when it looks like a momentum stock. And uh, Coke and McDonald's are starting to look like momentum stocks. Uh, they're trading more like 16 to 17 times earnings at this point, if I remember correctly. And, uh, you know, it's 
hard to sell something when it's still enough, but if you can get this to a particular strategy like this. Yeah. You're welcome. One, one, just one comment. I like your performance uh, contribution per quarter, but I was looking to see if I could have seen a year today all of those. She got lows and highs. I don't know if that's asking too much information. I mean, it's, it's great what you have. We should be. I'm going to raise the page. Hey, Jay. Hey, Jay. Uh, it's about quarters, the highs and lows, top contributors, bottom Right. I'm just thinking if I could have seen it like that yeah. month, you did it all three quarters, just a thought. Oh, I see what you mean. So yeah, so the year to date best stocks right. and all great stocks. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be happy to send those to Laura, you know, because we can do that probably if I can call back to the office and capitalize on that for you. Thank you. Okay, Jay, what's your next So because we're so concentrated, we can actually show you the whole portfolio, which we do on page 10 and 11. It only takes two pages. In case that prompts any further questions, what you see is not what we get, it's what we already have. Uh, and uh, we have them grouped by sector, but I don't want to mislead you in doing that. When we're uh, managing this research process, we are not deciding how much to put in any other <coughs> sector. We are picking these companies one by one um, and without regard to what sector they're in, letting the valuation and the characteristics of the business tell us what they're own. The one caveat, which is that we will cap any given sector at 25% to make sure we don't just keep fishing in the same place. And we do have some discussions of whether we have common factor risks across companies, whether they're too similar to each other and exposed to the same risk. But we're not sitting down and deciding to have X percent in consumer discretion, for example. Um, in fact, just using that consumer discretion, for example, given the way we have felt about the consumer for the last several years, I don't think we would have put anything in consumer discretion if we were thematic investors. Uh, but the stocks we're telling us are only the ones that you have here. We're glad that we have these really solid contributors. Uh, it turns out the cable business, for example, is about the last thing that will cancel in an economic downturn. And it's a remarkably stable subscription business, particularly since now your internet service is on that bill. And uh, one brief comment I might make about themes within the portfolio is that you'll see we have some consumer staple stocks we were discussing just a moment ago uh, that are you know well-known branded multinational companies like Kraft and Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Uh, McDonald's is under consumer discretionary but it's practically a staple here. Uh, and this tilt, if you will, within the portfolio might seem a little uncharacteristic. Uh, compared to these other one-by-one -one names that have their own unique growth stories that you've never heard of. Uh, and that tilt is really that uh, these companies make up in probability of growth what they might lack in high growth. That is that uh, we like that uh, we have a lot more visibility on some of these well-known businesses and that they're trading in very attractive multiples. Uh, it's a theme you might hear from other managers. It's important to tell you that we go about it thinking them one by one, as I said earlier. We don't say we want to have this theme of brand multinational companies and let's go find some. Uh, but in looking for attractive opportunities, we've surfaced these one by one. And uh, they've, they've added a nice stability to the portfolio in times of distress. If it's helpful on page 12, I've got a, a kind of an overview of the portfolio characteristics. It ranks the top holdings in the portfolio in that little left quadrant. I'll show you how the sectors break out on the pie chart on the right. And have a few of the valuation characteristics summarized on the upper left. Uh, one thing I left out is that uh, if you were to look at the revenues generated by the companies in this portfolio, 
approximately 50 percent would be from international. And uh, within that, between 15 and 20 percentage points would be from emerging markets. Uh, so it goes to show that even buying a domestic and domestically traded companies these days, you can get substantial revenue associated to high growth emerging markets and international generally. That's a kind of stabilizing factor. 